Semitic and uh, analog. I even have some, some charts I made when we were trying to get the original, uh, the, the thing went to me off. Uh, uh, come on over, Peter. Oh. Just from the standpoint, get, we want to get pictures and video for the archives. And, and can I do one thing before we start? Um, oh, yeah. Best practices says that we need to get a, a release so that we can use this. So I'm doing exactly what she's supposed to do. <laughs> and so while you guys are, are signing those, I mean, I just, I, I shared some of these questions with you earlier today, but uh, Connie is leading this effort in the, in the history department, and Jim Clark has been working very closely with her, and Bethany is, you're a graduate student, right? Mm -hmm, yes, sir. Uh, and we've been on a... Uh, some months quest to kind of review everything that we have in our archives about the Carter and, and how it evolved. But at a meeting that we had, I guess a couple of months back, uh, both Connie and Jim said, you know, it would really be helpful to have the anecdotal background, the opportunity to sit and, and talk with this team because we had described how it all began and how you four work together to make it happen. Uh, and so I volunteered that I, you know, the first idea was I was going to take everybody out to lunch. We didn't get there. <laughs> but uh, it, it really would be helpful if you all could just think back a little bit, before we get into any questions or any specifics, think back to how this all began. Randy, I think you probably picked up the ball and carried it from Pete's office to John uh, and started the conversation. And maybe you maybe went to Dan, we had I can't a, remember. We had a council of um, some 25 division heads of AT&T representing about 6,000 employees. Um, I had the smallest division and I was the oldest and the dumbest, so I got to chair the group <laughs> and uh, tried for 12 years to pass that gavel to someone else unsuccessfully. Um, in 95, uh, Peter and uh, uh, Peter's associate, Bob Cook, had shared that uh, there was a major expansion that was going to happen to their semiconductor manufacturing operation I then located on the south side of Orlando and it had the potential of being up to 1.4 billion and 1500 jobs and normally that kind of uh, operation gets most people's attention uh, but the concern was that the expansion at the time looked like it was going to happen offshore uh, based on incentives that were available to the tune of $90 million uh, payable in two years. And what we had in Florida at the time, uh, thanks to some research that Charlie Gray, the founder of the Gray Robinson Law Firm, and, and I had the pleasure of helping with, was that uh, Florida had about $6 million payable over seven years. Um, so with Charlie's help, we negotiated another $6 million also payable over seven years. So. Those of you who are really good at net present value calculations, uh, if you had 90 million incentives payable over two versus 12 payable over seven, I think I'm pretty sure which, which one you would pick. Uh, we had several things going for us. We had a great management team that didn't necessarily want to move to Madrid. We had a facility that was built three times larger in the early 80s uh, than needed at that time that we could readily expand into. But more importantly, we had a research capability provided by UCF and USF that uh, was not available offshore. And so uh, one day on the golf course, Roger, you were there, we shared with John that um, we're fighting a uh, potential losing battle uh, regarding this facility. And uh, John, you said, well, what? What do you need? What do you what do you have uh, the potential of having here that you don't have uh, 
offshore. And we replied to a research commitment that UCF and its professors and USF and its have been providing for quite some time. Um, so John, you checked with Betty Castor, then president of USF, and came back with a commitment of $20 million, payable over 10 years, a million per year per school, of a real asset, not something that we would try to figure out what it was, but a real asset. Uh, and that made the difference. Peter, why don't you? Well, let me add a little bit to the, uh, the first part. The, the opportunity to move to Spain, the Spanish government was providing the, uh, the uh, extra money, uh, it may have been appealing to some people, but it wasn't to me. <laughs> and it also wasn't to a group of 100 engineers we had moved from New Jersey and Pennsylvania to Florida just six months before that. And so we really, really wanted to find some way to stay in Florida. We like the facility, we like living here, and we certainly didn't want to move again. And uh, we weren't quite also all that sure about what would happen if we moved to Spain. That's exactly what it looked like. And so uh, when the opportunity to, uh, came up to find alternatives, uh, we jumped at those opportunities because they were important to us, as I believe they would have been to the state of Florida. And so we're in, we're in, the, in the right mood for that kind of operation. And the thing that made a difference is, I think you know, Randy talked about the money. If you look at the money that was on the table, and he, if it was just money, you'd go to Spain. You wouldn't, you wouldn't come here. Uh, but what was being offered, or what we worked out after a while with the, with the universities, was an opportunity to couple into two universities, two large universities, and, and connect in the research base in a way that we could never have been able to do in Spain. And we really were a very high-tech company. We're a leading edge in the semiconductor field. So having that kind of support was worth a lot of money. And so uh, it, became, it became an easier sell uh, when we could go back to the board of directors and say, look at what we can do here compared to what we can do there. And, and it worked. So what was the, what was the process, Dan, that took it through the legislature, took it to the next step, and actually it resulted in the, the creation of the entity? Well, it, the mathematics that Randy explained boiled down to um, a million dollars a year uh, for each of the institutions to offset the million dollars a year worth of research, uh, whether that was in kind or actually whatever it might have been, it had a value of about a million dollars. And uh, so our charge by the president was to try to find, you know, additional cash from the legislature to uh, make that happen. So my colleague, who has since retired at USF, Kathy Betancourt, and I started to work together on a strategy to simply get a million dollar earmark. We didn't think we could get a million apiece, but we thought we could get a million total. So our first visit was to Tony Jennings, who was president of the Senate and from here. And we proposed to her a million dollars. And she said, a million is too much. Seven figures is difficult for the legislature to absorb right now. I don't think we'd even talk about a, uh, anything less than that for a major project. But anyway, she said, why don't you settle on something a little bit lower? How about 850? And of course, Kathy and I said, yes, ma'am. 850 is fine. And actually, Tony was not president of the Senate at that time. She was chairman of the rules, exactly. About to be president of the Senate. Mm -hmm. And so um, she sent us down to uh, see the chairman of appropriations at that point, um, who was the infamous uh, Senator Childers. Uh, I don't make a personality judgment by saying infamous, but he was famous in some ways and not so famous in others probably. But Kathy and I went to visit with him and uh, he said, did Senator Jennings uh, approve of this and ask for this? And we both said, yes, sir. 
And his response, which I'll never forget, was, whatever that young lady wants, I'll give her. <laughs> young lady. <laughs> so um, the Senate was going to put $850,000 in the budget. The second part of that, and then the President was a witness to it, I probably ought to let a witness tell the truth rather than me embellish the story. <laughs> well, I'm eager to hear it. Uh, but, <laughs> now, I've uh, already heard some revisionist history, so... <laughs> But uh, our next step was to go to the House because we had a commitment from the powers in the Senate. Um, and there are lots of other commitments too in the Senate. Buddy Dyer, for example. I mean, Buddy was uh, uh, at the time one of the leading Democratic senators. I think he was later majority, I mean minority leader. But uh, we had his full support from the very beginning. So Senator Jennings knew that she with her support and with the minority leader's support, because you were in Buddy uh, Dyer's district at the time, that was pretty good. But we had to cultivate the House, and that's the way those things do. You have to go back and forth. So um, Representative Alzo Reddick happened to be chairman uh, in a democratically controlled House of the um, um, Committee on Transportation and Economic Development Funding at the time. So the President and I went to visit him and talk through the project and so forth and ask him for a million dollars and he said I'll do it. And then he calls his staff director in from around the corner, I forget what his name was, and uh, the staff director comes in and Alzo says I want a million dollars in the budget for this project. And he says well what is it and what will, will he do? And that's the source of the tale that whatever it is I had in my pocket. It's an envelope, so I recall. Yeah. I just wrote down a million dollars for UCF, USF, and AT&T to grow, retain, and attract high technology industry to the I-4 high technology car. And we handed that to the staff director. And that's how it came out in the bill. And that's what the source is of that original language. Now you got a million dollars in the House and 850 in the Senate. Guess what happens when you go to conference? Randy gets $925,000 and that's where the original appropriation came from. And it was also funded through Enterprise Florida, which a lot of people forget, which created some interesting situations later on. Had we created enterprise at that point? I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. About the same time. Let me, let me add a little bit to that because there's a piece that I think you might find interesting. I still remember the very first meeting we had. I met John and Betty Castor at the airport and we went to see Charlie Reed. And I didn't know any of them at the time. We all met for the first time. And Charlie Reed was the Chancellor of Education at the time. And, and basically I wanted to, or I was there for, was try to get some money out of it one of the universities, I wanted $10 million. And he, after he stopped laughing, said, no, don't you understand, companies give us you know, some money, we don't give them money. And we had a discussion about that, but after, after we were done, and John, that's where John showed, at least for me, the very first picture of the high-tech corridor, the lights along the two coats. Mm -hmm. sure. the, the middle sure. thing, yeah. I remember him showing that and describing the way, uh, at that time it was, uh, it was Dallas and uh, Dallas, Fort, Worth. Fort Worth growing together in him. That's the picture he had. And and in that discussion, I think Charlie Reed sort of bought into it pretty pretty well. Yeah. And as, at the end of the meeting, he said, look, I don't know how to do this, but but we shook hands and he said, I'll find a way. And I think what you described was the way. The way. I think you need to share, since you shared it with the Board of Governors and your fellow presidents, the, the idea of the court of coming to you. And, oh, yeah. and the shower. <laughs> yeah. um, Drives Dan crazy to hear this story. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> well, Dan will get over it. <laughs> we all take showers, Dan. Yeah. I, I know. Your historians are wondering what's coming. Yeah. Well, early in my time here, I um, had driven pretty much coast to coast through the center part of the state, and. Uh, you could see along I-4 um, infill of population and I'd watched that process take place in my native state of Texas between Dallas and Fort Worth. When I was a boy you could see you know the, the 
area between them was ranch land. There were a lot of cattle grazing along the side of the highway. You know, it was uh, really a, a rural environment. Well, by the time uh, I left Texas in, in uh, uh, 77, they've pretty well grown together. If you're if you driven along it in, in the last 20 years or so, you know, it's, it's just one big continuous metropolitan area now. Um, but it, you know, it occurred to me pretty strongly there, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are moving in and a lot of them will settle right along that corridor that you know, essentially goes from the uh, Tampa Bay area to, uh, the, uh, to da the Daytona area, but you know, it sort of spills down to, toward the Space Coast as well. And the question in my mind is what kind of jobs are they going to have? Uh, now we've got a great hospitality industry here in, in Central Florida, and um, you know it, it is the backbone of our economy in, in this in this part of our state, really for our whole state. But if you think about the the distribution of pay for the jobs that they've got, it's biased toward lower in, income employment. Um, now all jobs are good jobs, you know. <laughs> you think about it as if the alternative is unemployment. Just about any job is a good job, but um, it, it just occurred to me that if we really are going to have the kind of jobs we want our kids and grandkids to have, it would be really helpful if you could find a way to bring in more high-tech industry. And it seemed to me that we had a good chance with two large state institutions, each of which had a strong engineering program, a strong business program. The, the natural laboratory sciences uh, to support uh, uh, research and development. You know, we really could have uh, a, a guiding effect, if you will, on the development of the economy. And I had proposed to, to Betty Castor before Peter came on the, on the scene that we try to put together a cooperative endeavor and get some state funding for it. And, and Betty just had too many other things on her plate at that time. You know, she didn't really uh, respond all that favorably, I, you know, and I didn't. I didn't take that as a bad thing. I figured, well, we've got time. We'll winter over sooner or later on this. It's a good idea, uh, and we just went on. Well, then um, Pete's uh, opportunity challenge presented itself, and I think what you saw was the value of a good organizing concept. Um, it, it, there's nothing all that uh, overpowering about the idea. It's just it's sort of an observation. Gee, Dallas and Fort Worth grew together. I think I see the same kind of process beginning here in, in Central Florida. Isn't that interesting? Well, then you think about two universities and well, maybe we could have an influence on what kind of uh, jobs get developed. Maybe we could raise the, the prospects for high-tech industry. And then guess what? We get a really high-tech industry who's wanting our help. And uh, we were able to get enough people excited about the possibility to really do something. And uh, I've, I've said repeatedly, um, w without the opportunity to work with Peter, all we've got is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, you know, uh, better than no idea at all, but it probably would have come to very little of we hadn't had um, a uh, large-scale employer in a high-tech business who really wanted and needed our help. Um, you know, I think wanted more than needed. Uh, you'd have gone somewhere or another, you'd have gone to Spain or somewhere else uh, without us, but uh, you, you know, you wanted our help. And sometimes wanting something is every bit as important or more than needing. Uh, so we were able to put together uh, uh, an idea and uh, Dan's memory is just designed. We added, you know, it was the, the focus right then when we were in Alzo's outer office was retention. But we had the foresight to put attract, grow, and retain in that bill. <coughs> and that is indeed what let us go from this one instance to a general operation uh, that, that recruits, grows, uh, and we hope retains uh, high-tech industry. It, it's been a very interesting thing to watch. And, you know, without uh, without Peter, we don't have much. 
Uh, without Dan's skills in the legislature, we don't have much. And without Randy's uh, determined leadership and excellent leadership over the years, we probably wouldn't have nearly what we have. So it pays to take showers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a very unique uh, partnership. Uh, I had I had a lot of years at AT&T, and we had lots of partnerships with companies and the universities. But generally, they were they were designed for very specific application, and generally they were tense because the other companies are competitors and the universities really do what Charlie Reed said, give me the money and I'll give it back to you when I have the time. Mm -hmm. And what was happening in this relationship is, is right from the beginning, in fact the legislation you put together called out that this was a partnership, that there were certain uh, rights that the company, at t had to the intellectual property which was truly unique. Mm -hmm. and, and it made a big difference because now we could get research support from two universities, and we didn't have to give up the intellectual property that was generated in the process of doing that. And that was really a big, a big deal. And and I, I still remember telling other people about that, and they wouldn't believe it. They said it couldn't, couldn't be, mm -hmm. couldn't be. In fact, some other universities said it was illegal, even though it was in the legislation. <laughs> yeah, well, one university here in the state. No, that's right. Pete, I can remember you saying back then that you had, we were sitting together at the plant one day. We've never had relationships with universities mm -hmm. like this. This is unheard of. Well, the prevailing model in universities was that the industrial partner ought to throw money over a transom <laughs> and come back in several years to hear what the university had done with it. Well, let's not preclude that. And, and feel place. suitably proud, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, guess what, you know, when money is not terribly plentiful, the enthusiasm for that gets pretty darn scarce. And, the other, the other side is the intellectual property side. Uh, the university still does well out of this, and when you get to these partnerships, um, you know, my sense is that most universities want to control 100% and they end up with something about this big, and they think that's better than having 20% of something this big. And I've never quite seen that point of view get you anywhere. And it was interesting, and all the time we worked together, I can't think of any single case where we had a serious disagreement on intellectual property. It just wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. But people, people are paranoid about it's it. A yeah, it's a principle. You know. I've it's had the principle. pleasure of approving 12, more than 1,200 research projects. Dan, um, more than half of those being UCF, in my case with UCF, USF, and UF. Um, I can count on the digits less than the digits on one hand. The projects we did not get to because of an issue over intellectual property. And when you, when you share that with an audience to, to, that has this perception that there's going to be an issue, and you share, well, wait a minute, we've done 1,200 of them with 400 companies where we put up over 56 million to fund those projects from corridor funds at UCF, USF, and UF. And we have more than 160 million in corporate cash and in kind at the time we do the project and more than a billion on top of that in downstream return to the university to the companies and yet in, in, in going on about to finish 16 years we have really not had an issue on intellectual property because the companies see it that well this is unique our hometown university wants to help us they're not asking for the money back where is the value and the value is the partnership with the company that creates more jobs, uh, creates more intellectual value, and by the way, we've got an outside uh, investigator researcher that showed that there's more than a billion return to our local economy from from this program. Yeah. Let me let me just say that Randy had an awful lot to do with those languages and, uh, we, that we were able to translate into legislation. And the actual legislation that you're talking about, Peter, where that language about the IP was, was part of the uh, uh, matching mm -hmm. tax exemption mm -hmm. matching grant program. And uh, I always thought that pulling that off as a collective effort, uh, mm -hmm. taking advantage of really the goodwill of the company, the essence of that bill said that the legislature would put aside another package of incentive monies 
not just the money that we were operating the car drone and doing research with, but they had put aside another pot of money that if Serent would take the tax exemption uh, uh, that they were given uh, under the incentive laws, that if they would take the taxes they would have paid and send it over to the university, the state would match it out of that fund. So all of a sudden, both institutions were able to do really big things at once, like our materials lab. Yeah. That's where our materials lab to this day, seen as one of the best in the southeast, maybe the country, comes from. And that. That's right, and that's and where that. USF's, um, what was it called? Center Met for Materials Research. Yeah. Yeah. Sam R., the yeah. Center for Materials yeah. Research. So that was another um, uh, part of uh, that whole deal, the tax exempt matching grants that's kind of gone away because they don't have any money to match it with anymore. But I always thought that was a mm -hmm. one year in uh, one of the later years, the legislature decided to sweep together everything that they were funding for the high tech car because they all wanted to take credit for a big deal. So when they pulled together all the operational funds and showed the tax exempt matching, there's a line, and I forget what year in the budget, that shows something like $25, $26 million. Charlie's in California. So I cut that out, sent it to him, and said, Charlie, if you've ever seen a bigger turkey in Florida, I want you to let me know. <laughs> and he wrote me back and he said, nope, that's got to be it. It was a $25 million line item in the budget that pulled all that stuff together. One year. Help me with the name. Is it the Chronicle of Higher Education? Yeah. Is that the right term? Mm -hmm. I believe both of you about the same time shared with me an article that uh, our friend Charlie Reed crafted that appeared in there where he took credit for the corridor and, and explained in his version what it's all about. And it's pretty, that's pretty special from knowing where it came from. Yeah. Can I tell you one more quick story about Charlie? The first year was 950000 And then it jumped a little bit. And uh, uh, we were looking for, um, uh, in one of the years we were looking for, I think it was uh, another million and a half for each of us. And we wound up getting $1.7 million. Uh, and USF got $1.5. So we're down in the committee room where they are about to vote on it and make the decision. By the way, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee making this happen under Speaker Dan Webster is Orange County School Superintendent, not um, the school board chairman, Bill Sublet. He's the chairman of that committee. Right. So uh, Charlie comes up to us, with, to Kathy and me, with his entourage, which is not unusual, Charlie. He comes blustering, he said, well, I just took care of it. We've taken care of everything. You're going to get a million and a half. And uh, Kathy and I looked at each other and said, Charlie, you mean a million and a half each? He said, oh, no, 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 just a million and a half. I said, Charlie, the bill's about to come out. It's a million and a half each. And there was a $5 million appropriation for research, so we were going to get basically two-thirds of that money or, or close to it. And uh, Charlie did not speak to Kathy and me for a couple of weeks. <laughs> It's not nice to tell the chancellor he's wrong. <laughs> By the way, the original funding, uh, 925. The original funding, UCF got 300 for quarter funds, for quarter project, USF got 300, and AT&T got 325. Ask him if he ever took the money. Did you? No. No. Recurrent yeah. funding invested back in the corridors to two run this 16 privacy this room, for 16 years we've invested that money back in the corridor to help market the region as a high-tech region. That's pretty special. The thing we, we needed from university was the research. Mm -hmm. We didn't need the money. I mean, money's nice when we're taking it, but it was research. You know, if you think of the numbers, just over that whole period of time, we spent uh, a little over a billion dollars. We were exempted most of that time for the 6% sales tax that we're going to have to buy. That's $60 million. By giving a fairly significant piece of that, almost all of it, to the university, that was doubled by the state from close to $120 million that was shared between the two universities. That's a lot of money. 
And I still remember the time we were sitting there trying to think about how to spend them. <laughs> it was not, it was tough to do. <laughs> the results of that effort, not only the great research projects and the marketing, um, comes to us by way of uh, Roger Penn and Kerry Martin. Uh, it's interesting when an organization uh, outside our state uh, shares nationally the top technology regions in the country uh, based on information from January of 2012 to August of 2012. And I know if I were a better teacher instructor, I'd have a better show and tell graph. I gave a speech this morning out at ITSIC and I did the same thing to the audience. So even the first row, they couldn't see it. But what it portrays is... Randy, we, we prepare you better than that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> what it portrays is the top regions in the country. And we're number four, ahead of the research triangle and ahead of, of Austin. And the, and the measurement is the number of high-tech job openings. A positive statement that our region, uh, we'd like to have top talent come here as well as graduate from here. So it says, Florida High Tech Quarter. Me. It's certainly a manifestation of grow, retain, and attract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, when, when you were uh, going through that review of, of the expansion of the, uh, the state funding, just since it's a history project, I'm not sure, Connie, that we have been able to, and if we have, Carrie can take credit for it, get accurately give you that timeline of the, the progression of the funding. I think it would be very helpful to have if maybe we could work with someone. We have it. It's, we've had to go through digging it out. But yeah, okay. we can show you the bills and the amounts of money each time. Uh, and, and so you see, it wasn't just a one-time thing. If, if, if it had just been for the initial bill that provided Pete with that research that he needed, we'd have been a one-hit wonder. Right. And this would none of us would be here. But this was about the evolution of partnerships, and, and, and John realized very quickly afterwards that we had something here. Once, once he pulled it off with at and he said, hey, you know, this, we got a good deal here. We can help other people, and the more we help other people, and that led to the MGRP. Uh, the idea that we could create research projects on an ongoing basis, bringing companies on campus to do it, and, and having them kick the tires of young students as their the graduate students as their research partners. Just yeah. to, just to yeah, MJ swallow some credit for helping devise the program and working oh, with yeah. the folks at USF in making sure that the programs mirror each other. Um, yeah. It's been interesting watching all that you know, even even with MJ. Uh, the first response is how do I get part of that money? How do I <laughs> how do I get my share? my fair share of the money. And then it evolves, so you, know, you, you see people start to understand, oh, there is no share, fair share. It's all money that's there for a purpose. How do I get to be part of the purpose is really the, the, the question to ask. And if you, if you, I think if you conceive of it properly, uh, it's money that, that attracts, um, business leaders to the campus and incense faculty members to work with them. The big complaint you still hear today is how do I get the faculty to work with industry or how do I get industry to work with the faculty? Well, you put some money on the table to do good things and you, you, you get a little entrepreneurial interest, which is what we've done and Pete, you're, you know, you, again, without you in all of this, I don't think we're, we're celebrating anything today. But that's, Basically, you know, between the legislature and, you know, Dan's good influence there and uh, the leadership we've had from Peter and, and Randy, we've, we've created uh, a self-perpetuating cycle at this point, virtuous cycle. This is a small world we live in. What are the odds that we'd have this conversation today? And the new VP of engagement at FIU wanted to set a meeting and the only time we could do it was before this meeting and her predecessor was promoted to provost in Virginia and so Mark Rosenberg lost his focal point of cloning our corridor in his end of the state. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the new person is on board. The only time we can meet is right before this meeting. And she said, I apologize. I know you've been through this. I know you've come down here to meet, but we're basically starting over. Would you, <laughs> Roger's about to die. <laughs> Would you mind sharing with me again all about the corridor, how you got started, how you've done what you've done? I said, well, thank you. You're getting me a, getting me warmed up for a meeting with President Hitt and, and Peter Panousis and the rest of the team. I said, but it's going to take more than a half an hour uh, mm -hmm. to explain the length and breadth of what we've what we've done. So honored by the compliment again from Mark Rosenberg that he still wants to figure out yeah. how to make it happen. And that's one of the questions that Connie's had is can this be exported? So this is a great yes, conversation. Yes, it can be, but you need to have a, a good understanding and you, of, of the model and you've got to have a, a business leader. Yep. You've got to have a patron. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise you, you, you can write it all up and everything. We've suggested to Mark, you know, a couple of companies down there that could mm -hmm. be could be the, the patron that, that Dr. Venusis and, and uh, Sarah Aguirre was to us. You know, you know what's curious it is in Silicon Valley, the, the normal sense of businesses is they deal with universities. That's just what you do, particularly with Stanford and other universities. Well, and guess what? Be, yeah, it works. Fred Turman. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Fred, uh, as a young man, I was vice president of the TCU Research Foundation, and he served on our advisory council. And I got to sit and listen to Fred talk about how he, he didn't phrase it this way, but he started Silicon Valley. He came back after World War II. He had seen Route 128 outside Boston. He, he knew what had happened there. He says, you know, we could do that here. And he, he proceeded to, to do it. He was then Dean of Engineering at Stanford, became Provost, and, and really, uh, I think his, if you had to just pick some sort of high-tech industrial heroes, uh, Fred would be right up at the, at the head of the pack. See, there, there must be some in South Florida. You know, yeah. They have to be. And they just need to be... Uh, Can I ask a question <laughs> about that? Do you see the high-tech corridor as being more similar to Silicon Valley, or what? What has it added to the to the growth of the high tech industry? that's different from Silicon Valley. That's a good question. I don't know the inside of Silicon Valley well enough, probably to answer it uh, answer it uh, in a very well informed way. P, what do you? I I think that and I'm not sure I have a good answer, but but I think what happened there is they got to a critical mass that we never quite have gotten to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were so many companies doing the same kind of work that people were just filling out of each, setting up additional companies. And every new idea was a new company. And it just got to a level where it just was running by itself. Now, we never really got to that point. Or we, we, that. we may have a little more self-conscious um, direction at the university level than they do. It may, it may have become more just autocatalytic at Stanford because of, of that process you're talking about. We, we've taken a, a view um, that really says the university is uh, the agency that will help this happen in, in, in the uh, uh, region. And I don't, maybe I'm not expressing it well, but I think we we have tried to see the university, the the metropolitan uh, research university, uh, as the equivalent of the land grant university, the 21st century equivalent of the land grant, where we combine the uh, generation transmission application of, of knowledge, and it's a social agency, if you will, that that helps. Companies. John, your leadership, UCS leadership, and its partners, Medical City, is going to be, in my humble opinion, the catalyst that's going to give us give us that next boost in terms of comparing our quarter, our region, uh, to Silicon Valley. If you reference the fact that we all shook our heads when we had said right after World War II, or after World War II, having been there, like a couple of people in this room, yeah. we're very young. Uh, look at the time span. And yet, UCF is now celebrating its 50th. We're celebrating our 16th as a, as a corridor. We've got a lot of room to grow. And despite all the issues in terms of uh, Florida Poly, when they call us, um, Rob Goodell and team call to ask for some help in determining the focus, as you and I discussed, but to, to give them some ideas in terms of what they're going to focus on in terms of the curriculum. 
And that's pretty special, but it's part of this continuum of our region catching up with and maybe even surpassing Silicon Valley. But the university is still, if you notice, the university is still centric to, mm -hmm. to that happening. It, it, it seems to me that one of the, uh, well, I, I think it's, there are two very strong forces at work here that you've got to have to even think about duplicating anywhere. And we all travel and we all have got our canned speeches on the high-tech car and what it means and, you know, the advantages of it. But there are two things that the high-tech car has proven. And both of those uh, are related to one word, and that's partnership. First of all, it's just a spirit of partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mutually beneficial. We're willing to put on the table and sacrifice a little bit, or compromise, maybe is a better word. You do the same thing, and we're both going to just flourish after that. And then the second part of it is just to reinforce what we just said: is that. I don't think you can just be given some money. Other places in the state have tried to get an appropriation. They said they couldn't do it. Okay. What they got to have, though, is this yeah. kind of, again, spirit of partnership from a very large organization, or at least relatively large, so you can have an anchor and a tie. Let me, let me do one more. I can't help the opportunity for these political, but the, taking the word partnership. Okay. The High Tech Carta created something in the legislature that has never, ever happened. Not before and definitely not, sen not since, according to what I've been told. The second year of the funding. Okay. The money was eliminated at some point during the process. <coughs> and we had to earmark it back out of the Enterprise Florida budget. So we asked two people to sponsor the amendment to add it back on the floor during the final debates of the bills, okay? Way over here on the left side, one of the uh, most loyal Democrats of all time is Representative Alzo Rennick. And way over here on the right side, so far right that he told me one day that Dan introduces me on the right side of the stage and I'm so far right he thinks I'll fall off. That person was Tom Feeney, who was going to be Speaker of the House. So in front of the entire legislative body, outspoken Democrat, outspoken conservative Republican, stand together and offer an amendment to do this. There was not a single negative vote that I recall. And it was the spirit of partnership that has permeated this project all the way through, yeah. which I think has made it successful. Support for the university, for the community, yeah. uh, an effort to, to work together to build something. Mm -hmm. And until the medical school came along, and probably mm -hmm. now, I've always used in my conversations that, you know, the high-tech Carter is the perfect example of what mm -hmm. John Hitt means about being America's leading partnership university. Did the fact that the corridor existed and had been so successful, was that instrumental in having to bring the or laying the foundations? I, I don't know. It, it, the, certainly the successful experience uh, lent, uh, lent credibility to the university and, and our administration. Mm -hmm. I don't know that people drew the, le the people who were making the decision out that they drew lessons from the corridor operation, but the fact that we had done it yeah. and it was successful probably helped. Well, I, he's being modest because I know in some of the conversations we had on the medical school and the legislature that I had, and I can name three or four of them, very powerful members to say, um, if John Hitt says that this is good and it's going to work and it's a partnership, then that's all I need. And that's the truth. One of them had two children to graduate from here, so I'm not making those names up. But I think it did have maybe more than you uh, want to give it credit for is this spirit of partnership that uh, we're known for. It was certainly a track record by that time. Oh, yeah. And I don't think there's been a, a person in the governor's mansion since this happened who hasn't wanted to point to the Carter in some way or another at the start of every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the disappointment that I think we all share to some extent <coughs> is that it hasn't been replicated elsewhere yet. Mm -hmm. If there have been attempts. Right. Uh, it's good to hear that they're still committed to it, Randy, yeah. and we need to offer to but, get you know, what help we can. Part of the problem is you've really got to have industry, you've got, and you've got to be able to attract industry into it. So, you know, people will say the I-4 corridor, well, why don't we have an I-10 corridor or whatever, you know, if all you've got is a highway, uh, you, you know, you really, you're not going to, you're not going to do this. And, and it's, uh, it's still the case that some people think, well, if they could just get an appropriation, they'd have something. Well, they'd have that money, but I, they, they wouldn't, that alone would not give them what they're looking for if they're trying to replicate the corridor. You've got to have the you've got to have that employer who's really committed and you do have to have a critical mass of administration and faculty leadership who understand partnership and, you know I think there's still too many people in universities who just want to be given the money <coughs> uh, to go do what they want to do that's nice and uh, you know we'll all take that but it's uh, it's not going to give you the, uh, an organization like you now the partnership between the universities was also important. Now it's really mm -hmm. partnership. Uh, I still remember a meeting. I was, I was trying to recall what the background for it was, but uh, Governor Ludden Charles was at the meeting. That so it must have been 90, 96. 96, 96, 97. Yeah, and we had just gotten an award from one of the one of our customers. They were making the Palm Pilot at the time, and uh, we did something for that special. And we invited him to come to the meeting. He did. And uh, I remember in his presentation, he made a comment that I thought was really interesting. He said, he's never seen two universities actually work together, like the two, those two, mm -hmm. UCF and USF. And it was really interesting. He was, he was amazed that it could happen. I didn't know any better, so I assumed it could happen. Yeah. <laughs> An example of a partnership, and I'll share this with you. Uh, Gary Martin provided that. The gentleman pictured there, um, in 99, we partnered with a very small company. Um, he now has a billion dollar drug. He now also is the new VP of research at USF. And in the first meeting with him, he said, if we have an incubator company that wants to locate in Orlando, is there any reason why we couldn't figure out how to locate them in MJ Swallow and Tom O'Neill's incubator at UCF? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there going, oh, <laughs> what a burden has been lifted in terms of this is a <coughs> example of partnership that he would reach out mm -hmm. and I said not that I'm aware of and he said do you think they would agree that if they have a company in in their incubator that would want to move to Tampa that it'd be okay if we housed them and I said I think we can make that happen no let's send them to Mississippi instead yeah send them to Mississippi so there's Dr. Paul mm -hmm. Sandberg um, and thanks to Kerry Martin uh, who's going to give that to me by email I'm going to send that to Paul and say, there's a picture of you from the late 90s you might like to have for your file. But you know, they, they, have been, they have been doing anything they could to prevent them to, to leave. And so would we 20 years ago. You know, we hadn't quite gotten to that point. And this is, you know, the, I think the, the mantra of leave your logo and your ego at the door, the, the idea that whatever benefits Tampa can benefit Orlando and vice versa has been such a powerful philosophy. Uh, people have, have gone out of their way. You like to tell the story of uh, Linda, looking uh, over in Brevard County. Weather. 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 The economic development director over there, risking probably at the time for her job to put, was it 500 or $5,000 into a sponsorship of an event that was going to take place in Tampa? 5,000. 5,000, I think. People we indicated we would help her with something downstream, but that was understood. But yeah, that she would be willing to do that. But she understood that she yeah. might benefit down the road from it. Yeah, that whole notion that a win anywhere in the corridor is a win for everybody is hard to... We called uh, Dr. Paul Sandberg, uh, who's a, a uh, very respected scientist, the founder of the National Academy of Inventors. Um, and we have a project that we're working on that uh, is a very large in scope. 
almost as large as one of Peter's projects. And we needed some additional funds to put on the table to get the company's attention. So I called Paul and I said, uh, uh, I know that our team was over about a week before this phone call to show support for a major project in the Tampa area. I said, we have one, by coincidence, small world, we have one a, a week later, as, that, as big as that one. Um, if we can merge our matching grants funds at UCF and USF, we can make a better case. And he said, make it happen. What are you putting on the table? I said, we're going to make a commitment of 250000 a year for five years because of the size and scope of the Tensions Project. He said, you want to do the same thing from USF? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, it doesn't matter where the graduates work as long as they're working here. So the fact that you're going to give an opportunity for some of our USF students to partner with, and professors to partner with UCF on a project for a company that happens to be located in the eastern end of the corridor, our students are going to be benefited, so make it happen. That's partnership, and it's you know, 15, 16 years in the making. You know, there's another activity that uh, uh, a lot of folks don't participate in or know much about, and I, I, I've always thought that this was one of uh, Randy's brilliant creations, and that's what he calls the core team and the Tuesday morning telephone calls. Mm -hmm. Every Tuesday morning, there's, I'd say, 25 to 35 people from throughout the corridor who talk about what's going on in the corridor, and by the end of that conversation, what reminded me was Linda Weatherman, you've got Brevard County willing to go over to Tampa to participate with the Tampa Bay Partnership, You've got four or five groups agreeing to come together to put money on the table to do a booth talking about the photonics industry and sending it to the West Coast. You're doing things that the state as a whole has not been able to get communities and EDCs yeah. and workforce boards and all those things to do. You, you're so we are doing things every Tuesday morning on that little pajama hotline that the state has never been able to do. It's amazing to yeah. see the number of, this, this is the- This is a 16 year document. She has oh, she a has. box. <laughs> she has Steve Burley's collection of every single one of us. It's an old AT&T thing Peter and I learned years ago. What's bolded in there, including the names of the people as well as what's in there is what covered was covered the previous week. So you know who attended and you know what was discussed and it becomes the agenda for the next meeting, so you can and continue. And I tell you, that's very helpful to a historian who's reading well, through this. You know, we need to get you in touch with Burley before the end of this, because he's, the fact that he's collected them means he's got a lot of knowledge. The, what I can remember as an example of that, that we achieved corridor-wide participation in the Paris Air Show on the telephone on a Tuesday morning, had never had it. Because Linda Weatherman wanted to do it. That's right. In Brevard, and so we got Tampa Bay saying, "Yeah, we'll do that with you. We'll be there with you." In she terms of those presents and over five thousand, mm -hmm. and now we have on an annual here. basis right. participation <laughs> to market this area's aerospace. What a yeah. silver tongue devil she, she is! is. She is. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's chaired the Federal Reserve Board in Florida, in Jacksonville, amongst, amongst her many talents, with a with also with a master's degree. She's a pretty sharp lady. Yeah, chaired our workforce committee. Um, what's what's unique is that we started this uh, in 96, 97, somewhere in there, and we couldn't get p folks to attend, mainly our economic development partners, uh, for a four o'clock call. So, you know, get one fit of brilliance a decade, I'm going, wait a minute, why don't I just have it at 7.45 in the morning? They can't, they can't claim they're out working, selling deals and, and getting and entertaining prospects at 7.45 in the morning. So. Half the folks on there are on their drive time. We ask them to be on mute and make sure they drive carefully. Um, but every every Tuesday morning, unless it's a holiday week, Dan, you're on everyone at 7.45 to 8.15. And it's over at 8.15 because everyone on there has a full-time job doing something else. There's a lot of spouses across this corridor who 
wonder what's going on on a Tuesday morning if you don't have a call. <laughs> well, that, what's happening? You're still sitting here drinking your cup of coffee, reading the newspaper. You're supposed to be on the telephone. You, you know, I still think, Roger, that, uh, and you and I talked about this, so, but just for the purposes of conversation, that's one example of a, of a critical activity of the Carter that's not as glamorous sounding as the matching research. There's another one. There's the Tech Path program that's uh, um, done Jeff, with the... Dr. Uh, Jeff Mendel, one Jeff of Peter's Mendel, top scientists. Jeff Peter's guys, who's now in our physics department, who does this and now going all over the place trying to uh, get the other institutions and school boards and schools to learn about uh, what it is to be a, um, in high technology. And another one, the Florida... Uh, virtual Entrepreneurial Center. I mean, people don't, Roger, I just don't think the average person or even the average politician realizes how those three parts of what we do, the core team and the partnerships, the tech path and the Entrepreneurial Center, what a key element they are. And there's nothing, nothing anywhere in the state comparable to those three activities. Hunt Deutsch is the, uh, the head of the Department of Economic Opportunity. I'm honored to have known him from the mid-80s when my daughter worked for him in the trust department when he had a trust department for Sun Trust. They were going to have a business portal they were going to launch. They didn't know what they were going to do, but they were going to launch it. We were at breakfast, and I said, well, Hutton, we already have one. It's called the Florida Virtual Entrepreneur Center. What's it do? I explained to him what it does. He said, why, why do we want to launch one of our own? Why don't we just use yours, and you'll, you'll have a link, and we'll call it a state for I said, it's called a Florida virtual entrepreneur center on purpose. It's all 67 counties mm -hmm. are, are up and running um, and they on that. Know it. Hmm? They didn't know it. They didn't know it, mm -hmm. but they do now. They had a webinar earlier this week to explain the program. So if you're an entrepreneur and want to start or grow a business, it doesn't cost you anything to use it. And every county is there. You just punch on a county. Roger, show them to you. Better show This morning, we got the, the, the monthly report. We got a monthly report on the activity. 14 times in there. Last month, 13,629 visits for all 67 counties. And even though it was the, a holiday month, uh, that's 3.65% a, a increase month over month. Hmm. And out of state, 2,700 people from out of state were checking in on that. And out of country, more than 500 people visit to find out what's available, what's going on, for how can I do business here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing thing. It continues to grow. Uh, you know, Carrie, what's, what's the month to month, month on the line? It's just amazing numbers. Yeah, they've continued to grow since the about 4,000. But give Carrie Martin the credit, if you would, because when you see it, that's her she's, creativity. She's the walking history. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and the other piece is, though it's quarter funded, it doesn't cost the entrepreneur to use it, it doesn't cost the, like the Greer Robinson Law Firm, our attorneys, they can post on there that they're available to help entrepreneurs. It doesn't cost them anything to post. Now, if you'd like a little better listing, thanks to Roger Penn and Kerry Martin, or if you'd like to sponsor a section, you can certainly do that. Uh, so you think in terms of Miami coming up with 10, excuse me, with $7,500? You think of Jacksonville, Duval County coming up with $7,500. So we raised about 85000 last year before we added all the other counties to offset the cost of what we've been putting in in terms of a couple of people that work at, uh, on a daily basis. One of whom is a UCF graduate student in Michael's, Michael Zaharias, who's an OPS employee reporting to Tom O'Neill. So uh, again, it's a statewide program. How's it, how's it you see it? Thank you, Dan. I, I have to say that um, I think that kind of uh, retaining and growing of, of, of businesses is perhaps one of the most important parts of this. Um, I'm a Southern historian, and I, I look at the economy across the South, and, and mostly what I see is buying jobs, mm -hmm. not, not retaining them and growing them. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been interviewed a couple times by the, by the uh, Federal Reserve in, in Atlanta uh, about some things I've written about that. And, um, and I always say, you know, that 
that the South is missing the boat when they just keep buying mm -hmm. jobs. Your pride is our pride in getting a call from the Economic Development Organization for Atlanta, the greater Atlanta area, looking to create a corridor between Atlanta and Athens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they call and say, how'd you do it? What do you do? <laughs> Can we clone it? Do you mind if we clone it? And I said, and that's just one of many. One yeah. of many. We've had a lot of calls from around the country, from out of the country. We've had Randy talking to people in Thailand. In Puerto Rico, um, the uh, lead attorney for the House and Senate in the state of Colorado, a co-ed from uh, Kennedy School of Government wanting to start a high-tech region around Sy Syracuse. Yankton, South Dakota. Are you familiar with Yankton, South Dakota? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get this call from Charlie Gross, the, mayor, the then mayor of Yankton. Uh, we'd like to start a high-tech corridor between South Dakota State and University of South Dakota. He said, roughly the same geography. Two universities, <coughs> you have two to start. How'd you do it? What do you do? I had a lot more cows than me. And, uh, yeah, and I spent uh, three calls, a total of six hours, keeping track of these things with Charlie Gross. Uh, I got a call from the head of, of economic development for the Cherokee Nation. They wanted to do, <laughs> my boss is looking at me, does he look at you like this every All day? the time. All the time. He wanted to diversify <laughs> their gambling instead. <laughs> it's a Cherokee, North Carolina. Okay, God bless him. I said, great. I said, uh, where do you live by chance? Because I know where, I know where. I know where the, the, the gambling establishment is. I've been there, but I know where it is. <laughs> and he said, well, I, uh, you probably don't know it. I, li I live south of 74 on 28. I said, where? And he told me. I said, well, if you come about six miles further south and, and turned on uh, onto Trillium Trail, that'd be where we have a place. No kidding. So I struck up a friendship with the head of economic <laughs> development. So Randy's now a player at the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the church <laughs> <and> casino. <laughs> is that a hoot? Yeah. Uh, do you remember the old... TV program Get Smart. No, yeah. oh, yeah. shoot, shoot. Do you, well, yeah, but do you remember the episode where they they had the uh, the uh, Indians who were they, they had a, a nuclear tipped arrow <laughs> out of the TV? <laughs> out of the TV, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> what was it? Smart says that's the third biggest arrow I've ever seen. <laughs> You know, you talk, what, Connie, you talked about the, 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 the path here versus buying jobs. And I know that one of the questions that you had said that you were interested in exploring was the, uh, the role that we played in the GROW FL program, the economic mm -hmm. gardening program. And I think that's, that goes, Dan, along with the others that you mentioned as one that, uh, while well, there are folks that know that we've been, we were behind the, the, uh, the we were, really kind of a catalyst to get that moving. Uh, they, they don't realize just what it's done. There are, there are a lot of companies out there that are really benefiting from the kind of counsel and advice that they're getting to get them from where they are to the next stage. That's the creativity of uh, this university and Tom O'Neill. Mm -hmm. And convincing as he is to get Roger Penn and yours truly and Ray Gilly, and uh, Amy Ivancho, uh to go to Cassopolis, Michigan Cassopolis. in November. And then he doesn't get to go. We end up there and he's still <laughs> here in the middle of November to- He um, was lucky when he yeah, was a guy. smarter guy. He's smart, well he's got the doctor from here and an MBA. Um, what do you expect? Uh, Mrs. Lowe, has this wonderful facility of, of 2,600 acres that house 14 farms, amalgam together. We did all the farmhouses, so you can stay in a nicely redone farmhouse, or you can stay in their center. And what they share is economic gardening. And, and, and uh, Littleton, Colorado, the experience that that community had of losing a 10,000 employee Lockheed Martin plant. And they decided never again would they be dependent on one facility for their livelihood. So they started by building their own. And so the, the, the orchestration of that is the platform for this Grow FL program. You need to ask, how did Mr. Lowe make his millions? Okay. 
Kitty litter. Kitty oh, you know. litter. Oh, oh, I should have let her answer. Wow. <laughs> you know, she has 2,600 acres around Arcadia, Florida. Mm -hmm. Special. Yes. She's a cool lady. She's very devoted to work. So the idea started. that we can help bootstrap our own companies. Um, and one of our counselors, George Gordon, went through it. He said after, in fact, we've used him, as you know, Dan, thanks to your leadership in, in the um, House and Senate to give testimony. He said, Randy, not since my days in Annapolis have I been grilled, and even there, as much as I was grilled by people who knew more about my business than I did, uh, as a way of taking another look of how you might be a better business person and, and make your company more profitable. You know, I went through the, uh, the CEO roundtable portion of the thing, and I was amazed to see uh, folks who had very sophisticated companies I think one of them, fellow has a company called Alinean, their uh, internet services company. Brilliant guy. And he was eyes wide open in that process, that sharing around the table that the, the program was facilitating. And one day he stopped in the middle of it, got up, and left because he'd gotten the answer he needed. We didn't see him for two months until <laughs> he had finished implementing it. So it's amazing when you can see what happens in our state when a governor who had received some poor advice last year uh, vetoed the program that we were told by his staff he was going to approve. Uh, and then within two weeks of the veto in the villages, was out in the state espousing the virtues of supporting small stage two companies. We need to do more of that. And so we had some folks whisper to his team to whisper in his ear, you just vetoed the least expensive program in the state that has created the most jobs for the least amount of money. And so we think that impetus, as well as some excellent work on Dan's part and the team, uh, two million, two million funding, refunding this year. Um, Carter funded it, and then we got a call from Jennifer Thompson, uh, who'd been told by Mayor Jacobs that they found some extra money in Orange County. And Jennifer didn't want to invest in sidewalks. She said, I want to invest in companies. I've heard about this Grow FL program. I'd like to know more about it. So Tom O'Neill took a meeting with her, made a friendship, 50,000. So while that 50,000 was happening, we of course went to the county on the north to say to Randy Morris and his mentee, Bob McGlory, who's now chair of Seminole County, just reelected that this is gonna happen in Orange County. So Seminole said, well, we want part of that too. They put in 50,000 uh, to help this program, to match our 50,000 that we put in to keep it alive last year. And now it's obviously going great guns this year because the state has seemed fit to invest in it. It's run out of UCF, but it's a statewide program. It, it, these things are good examples of what you can do with discretionary funds under enlightened leadership. And when people talk about they want to reproduce the corridor uh, or try to uh, expand their operations or activities, we do have a foundation that nobody in this, else in the state has. Nobody else in the state's been able to get or sustain. And uh, uh, Randy gives you an example of how I think he very wisely has used a lot of these funds that uses them as incentives or uh, matches or initial investments. And the, but the truth of the matter is, without those dollars, he could not do that. And, and it's very hard for others to get that same hold. Mm -hmm. I don't think today we could do that with the current economic situation and the current political leadership, <coughs> um, we're a, I don't think we could do we're it. We're a 501c6 in the state of Florida with a fairly substantial budget by comparison. How many employees do we have? We're all consultants to the enterprise. Oh, it's the most cost-effective way yeah. of running it. Um, the idea that, that you would have a corporation set up to do these things, that as we talked in 96, where does the money reside? 
resides at the two universities. Well, three, because we've been able to get some one-time funding on occasion for UF and would hope to not remedy that and get uh, David Norton, their new VP of Research, said it's his number one priority and he's going to make sure Bernie says it's their number one priority to get recurring funding uh, at, at UF for quarter funds. But the funds reside at the university because if they transferred them to the corridor, a private corporation, you got a red flag, you got a target. Oh, by the way, having run an accounting organization at AT&T years ago, excuse me, I had really good people that did it and I kind of showed up, okay. <laughs> um, accounting and auditing is an expense. By the university managing it through their existing processes, both the accounting and the auditing, uh, the, the corridor doesn't have to incur that expense. Therefore, we can use more of our corridor funds to do the matching projects that Dan, Dan just talked about. But you notice the item of trust there? We've been doing this finishing 16 years. You're chronicling it. Um, how many issues have we had over the, the spending of funds in that many years? Except for your travel, oh, excuse me. <laughs> my, travel, <laughs> my travel buddy. No, okay. Sachs takes me to Dallas and, and oh, so later, later, this, later this week. Uh, and you're right, it's been an experience. We just <laughs> you told, told me. You told me that. They <laughs> wanted him to come on to the commission on colleges. I warned him. Oh, you have a clue what you're getting him. I said no, but I got some real good friends that, that can help. The idea is, is that the university has trusted its volunteers, uh, as well as consultants, as well as team members, to do the right thing to spend the money in the correct fashion. The majority, again, the majority of the funds are spent on the, on the matching grants projects. But people say you've got an organization and it, you know, it's, got, it's got what it does. And said, no, it's really, it's like an ad hocracy. We come together, we address an issue, address a problem, put some resources to it. By the way, we thought we created that term. You're a historian. No, we found out, we did some check. I think Roger did it. It was created, somebody came up with it in 72. Adhocracy. And that it was not a compliment. No, right, probably not. But we come together, address an issue, find some funds, get some other people that have some funds, do it, and move on. We did. Uh, Randy and I, uh, in the last year, requested an audit because you know, with all the mm -hmm. things that keep popping out, and uh, um, they finished the audit, haven't given us a written report, and uh, but uh, it, it's a. There are no questions. There are no management statements, any negatives. She asked for a little more in terms of elaborating on why we're putting money into the Royfeld program. I said, I think we can fix that. So yeah. I got a hold of Fran Karozik and said, Fran, I need a little more detail on the, the use of the quarter funds. And the other, you immediately fixed that. It, I, I have to confess, I didn't know it at the time. I'd like to take credit for it or give us credit for it, but using that term attract attract implies recruiting public relations advertisement things that you a lot of things you can't do with normal state funded money because the original appropriation has that word attract in it uh, randy is exempted from some of the regulations for instance he can uh, do things with state money that we can't that relate to meetings and conferences mm -hmm. and uh, I wish we could say we were that smart in the beginning but it just worked out that way. Said you that well since you're talking about funding um, I, I've been teaching a class this semester in U.S. economic history and I divided my class into groups and each group did a project and one group did a project on the high-tech corner. That's, that's, so that's they, they did their presentation today, and I said, I'm No, wait, 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 wait a minute, excuse me. We're having this conversation today. I had the conversation with the FIU lady, and now your class. Randy's writing a book on small. Uh, I have a world book on small principles. world. Okay. I should work harder on this book. But <clears throat> really, this is. <laughs> well, they gave a very nice presentation, and after it was over, I told them I was coming to this meeting, and I said, If you had a question to present to this group, what would you ask? And they thought a minute, and then they asked, what is the role of venture capital in the Florida high-tech corridor? Is there a role? And if there is, what is it? It is, it is us. 
We are a unique we venture, are, capital. We are venture capital. That's what we are, and, and the uniqueness is we don't ask for our money back. Find a venture capitalist that will do that and not ask for the money back, and I'd like to see Why which, they were see which asylum the gentleman is. Private, because, mm -hmm. private venture well, capital. There's, there, are two, there are two sides of that, Randy. We do want, we are very supportive of the venture capital organizations. Yeah. Uh, the right. Florida Venture Florida Venture Forum. We are we are supportive, even though they changed their. If I may, mm -hmm. they changed their model about a year and a half ago and said we're no longer going to support support small companies. And as gently as I could, I'm saying, well, you may just have lost a sponsor because we can't be attached to that regimented approach to lunacy of not supporting your livelihood going forward. To make any sense. Um, they changed the administration, they changed the board. And this is? At the Florida Venture Forum. Okay. And if you'll find the gentleman's name on this list is now part of our Tuesday morning call. He called and said, if I told you we've changed and we're going back to support small companies, can we come back in the fold? I said, absolutely. So Maybe an undeveloped or underdeveloped part of what we do, though, when you think yeah, about it. Is. We, we really, that's probably been the thing we've talked the least about. Okay. And I'm not I'm not involved day to day with this, uh, you know. But uh, if I had to think of one area that I would say we might do more in, from my standpoint, their students are very astute. But Grow Florida has that as one of its objectives. So mm -hmm. we use our funds to help start Grow Florida and support that yeah. aspect of their mission. We, we have done over the years a number of things to support efforts to expand venture capital flowing into the state. We hosted a group on the far western end that came here from around the country, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but they go, actually an international group, John, and they go from market to market very quietly and find a, a sponsor like us to come in and show them what's there. Yeah. Uh, we've been very supportive of the forum. But I think you're really right. That's an area that we, and, and this may be the time for us to, to step back and really look and say, what can we do? Because it's the one, that we are two things from when we get with our uh, Central Florida Tech Forum or the Tampa Bay Tech Forum, there are two issues, workforce, finding the talent, and venture capital. Right. And that's why Randy always says we are venture capital because Although we started with a mega giant like AT&T as our partner, there are a lot of companies mm -hmm. that uh, are getting funding for that matching, to that matching grant research program. But otherwise, it would have to come from a venture capital. Yes. May I compliment your students, number one. And number two, we have a pretty strong history of funding starving graduate and doctoral students. Well, that's going to be 2,400 through our matching grants program over the 16 years. Uh, and Carrie is the keeper of that, of that stat. Uh, we have two interns right now uh, in Tom O'Neill's shop helping us with um, economic impact studies that we do. Uh, but the question they've posed presents an opportunity for some Carter funding back to your organization and to them. I don't believe as a state we do a good enough job of chronicling the venture capital invested in who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who are the venture capitalists investing in in our state? Um, how much if we can capture that? But take it more than just venture. If I can expand their question and, and, and have it friends and family, starting with some crazy things I've done over the years, I have to admit, as, as well as angel funds, which I had that much money to qualify for that. Um, and all the way to venture, all right? Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I think they'll get a better understanding of the, of the difference in those categories mm -hmm. and who they apply to. But more importantly, we may end up with a better study than we've ever had in terms of what is happening in Florida and what can we do then to change the paradigm that we think exists of the folks that, that are in Peter's category of, of having some mega bucks and, and all. And, and why is he not investing in Florida, but he's investing, well, no, he's investing in the Carolinas, but 
the, the, the history we think we have. You're making a pretty good payment at the Cherokee Nation. I'm not a Cherokee Nation. <laughs> <laughs> That's going, going to my church. Yeah. What can we do to identify better why we think the folks that have some money to invest are investing it in the states and the companies in the states from whence they came? Okay, well, so or in California, in California or New York, you know, that, I, I didn't mean my comment to be at all critical of what we're doing or not doing, but if I had to think of one area right. that, that we might be doing something in that I've sort of thought and heard the least about in, in discussions on the quarter, that's probably it. And it may be an opportunity for us. Yes. You're on a leadership board with the Metro Land EDC and some of the refocus and things they're doing. To have this study, maybe have it annually for them mm -hmm. for the EDC mm -hmm. critical in terms of it's just not hunting it's not major hunting in major boxes it's growing and starting and growing our own and having a better idea of the potential of, of investment capital no matter what size we would benefit from that so compliment them please and the astuteness of their question well I, I was somewhat shocked when they came up with that question <laughs> it's a good question it's a good yeah question. Um, since you brought up the, the, the subject of workforce um, as well, one of the things that struck me about the High Tech Corridor as opposed to some other places is, that, is the amount of um, effort that has gone into the partnerships to create um, a, a solid workforce that's going to do more than just put together widgets, but, but actually can make a contribution. That's, so from, the golf, that's from the golf course. Um, That's from the okay. <laughs> we're, we're sitting on. A lot of things happen on the golf course. <laughs> John, John goes, Some of them we can talk about. <laughs> yes, I understand. John that. goes, let me get this straight. This is, gosh, this has got to be 12 years ago. This is when Feeney was speaker. He said, You want to take some Carter money and invest it with the community, co community, well, community colleges in? Um, I said, Yeah, John, you want to be the number one metropolitan partnering university. And if you don't help the companies that are in your backyard do a better job of getting the technicians they need and giving the technicians a chance <laughs> to get a baccalaureate, so then you're not going to be as successful in the partnering categories you could be. And when you think in terms of the great relationships that exist between UCF and the state and community colleges, um, the idea of funding seven associate degrees, which is what we've ended up doing with uh, a little bit before we got the the funding thanks to Dan and Speaker Feeney, but the workforce money that we've received uh, of, of with seven different uh, state community colleges funding those associate degrees uh, is pretty special. And we put about a, an average of about 150000 into each one of them with the caveat that the community, state college, community college would bring the industry to the table, define the need, develop the curriculum from what the industry said the need was, but then structure it in such a way that the graduate, should they elect to do so, could go on and get a baccalaureate. Now, I'll give you an example. I'm going to watch your facial expression. Okay. Um, Volusia did the modeling simulation and training degree. There's been 600 enrollees. Ask me how many graduated, have graduated to date. Program's about four years old, five years old. How many? 30. You see, you see that. And the individual, when I reacted the same way, I'm going, "What did we put the money? What did we, you know, with 30 graduates?" He said, "You didn't ask the right question." It goes to the, it goes back to your question and supportive workforce. I said, "What?" He said, "Well, ask a different question." He said, "Why don't you ask me how many have jobs? Light bulbs, light bulbs." He said, "All of them." I said, "You're telling?" He said, "They're hiring them after they get the first year in." There's enough guts to the program that the corridor helped them devise based on industry input to get enough that the industry are hiring them after they finish the first year. And I'm going, what happened to this idea of giving the technicians a chance to get a baccalaureate? He says, you're helping the industry through the program that you've that you've funded. They can't they can't get these they can't get enough of these technicians. You no, know, that goes back a long way. Remember when we were looking for people, we could find engineers, we pay enough money to come from California, come from wherever. We could not find technicians, and we started some of the programs in the community college. The first one, the first one, and we were paying a lot of money. We were stealing them from Disney and from other companies, but they weren't enough around to, to really mm -hmm. build it. Was the more, was, 
That was the most difficult job to fill, was the technician's job. Technician. That was the first one. And that's also why we started Tech Camp. Tech camp. Yeah, it was right. originally Chip Camp. Yeah. 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 At, at, I at, forgot. Sarah, that. I think there's a. There's, there's a thing in a uh, uh, book that really influenced me, Lester Thurow's book, Head to Head. Um, he, he says economists in Germany make more than uh, they, make, maybe they make more than they do in the U.S., and it's because the technicians in Germany make more. <laughs> you know, the, the, the guys out on the floor who really make the stuff uh, make more. Uh, that's a lesson we... Ben Knoll, the head of Florida Interactive Entertainment Academy, when he was number two at Electronic Arts or whatever his set, satcher, right? When we asked him to be at the table to help determine the digital media associate degree at, at Seminole State College, um, he was at Electronic Arts. Uh, I don't need technicians. Within about four months of that, he transitioned from Electronic Arts to FIA, and he called, and I'll count on you to clean this up if it, if it makes your report. He said, I will find the biggest crow in Central Florida. I'll cook it any way you ask me to cook it, and I'll eat it in front of any audience you, you choose. He said, I need technicians. He said, I want technicians to go through the UCF program but coming in as technicians because they offer a different perspective and that all are needed. That I need the I need the technician perspective, then then the baccalaureate, and then we'll do some we really need things with them at FIA. But ask Ben No uh, about that. He reaffirmed that by the way because he hosted our tech camp, the one that took place today this morning kicked off for ITSIC. The last one was at FIA, which he hosted, and he allowed me to tell this story so that the the, the teachers from from schools all over the, the, our court would understand that their students, it's all right to be a technician as well as then get your baccalaureate. So what that means is that everything we do is really workforce development. Every bit of it. And he who wins at workforce development wins at economic development. 2, starting, starting with kids in, this, in, in middle schools and high schools. In fact, if MJ or Tom were here or Dr. Sandberg, um, or Tracy Schwartz, or, or David, David uh, uh, Norton, UF, or Shaba Jason Carr, who runs the program there, they would tell you that if the program that gets to our desk for approval, Peter's still one of the approvers, doesn't have students built into it, yeah. hmm? doesn't happen. It, 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 very rarely does it happen now. Uh, because the intent was, we're doing applied research to help a company, but we want the students part of that process. Excellent. Clark hasn't asked any questions. Have you noticed that? It's been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I thought it was just Roger. <laughs> oh, come on. We, we're so good at this. Listen, he never, he never misses a chance to do, sing me a little bit. I, no, oh, listen, no, I, no. I, have, I have a string today, John. I've got him under control. <laughs> I, have, I have talked to Connie about this. Although it's called the I-4 corridor, is there any limit to the north-south expansion? We actually changed the name from I-4 because it turned out you couldn't trademark uh, the name of right. the interstate. So it's the Florida high-tech corridor now. It could be the XYZ corridor if somebody but, else. But do you see it? Keep it going. Keep it going. Well, it you've got to have business. Well, even north of Gainesville or, or south. But really? you've got to have business and some kind of employment. It wouldn't have to necessarily be high tech, but you you need an employer base that you that you work with. We've used it as leverage. The governor has accepted it thanks to John and Bernie's oratorical skills, witnessed by some folks in the room. We were a plank in the governor, one of eight in the governor's economic development plan when he when he was governor elect. If you look at the most recent report out of the foundation for, for Florida Chambers Foundation, we are a, a, a plank in their 20-year plan to replicate this around the state. Uh, Mark Rosenberg, uh, because of the friendship, because of working together, 
and said, we would like to clone what you've done, how you've done it, from Miami to Orlando. He didn't call it the I-95, he just simply called it, in fact, Roger and Carrie have been helpful in trying to get him to name it. The idea is, rather than become one huge, we yeah. think it's five city-states in our state, regardless of what we try to do to make it a state, mm -hmm. why don't we build on that strength? We've, um, tried, to, we've tried to get them to, for instance, Jim, uh, connect all the way over to the Florida Gulf Coast uh, and, and become a South Florida version of this. We basically cover the central portion of the state because we're a partnership of the three universities. We define it as you've got to be in the, the, the primary service areas of the universities. Now, Florida as a land grant has this statewide mission but they are, uh, they have defined, was it Alachua and they added Bernie two Bernie agreed, I know you're quick to go away with their land grant, they can go anywhere, but Bernie agreed that we would try to keep the idea of a corridor, yeah. and so therefore it was just Alachua and Putnam that we added when we added UF, and that was their request. Yeah. But you, you really do have to have an identifiable employment base that you're gonna service, and it can be high tech, it can be something else. So you're encouraging Mark to start his own, not join yes, you. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you know, if he wanted to join us, that's fine, but he, he still needs a, a base of employment down there. He needs some companies that he's serving and, and who will work in partnership with him. And, uh, you know, absent that, he can get an appropriation, he can get all the free consulting from us, uh, from Randy, that we could possibly give, but he really won't have an organic entity you know you, you've got to have the the real partnership you know you've got to have a peter panusis who says i need the research you know i i've got a i've got a series of problems that we can work on together and absent that uh you know you've just got another university office we got the first funding based on the success of what was done mm -hmm. for peter and the two universities we got the second funding based on skills that Dr. Holzenberg, <coughs> Holzenbeck has. We got the second funding because of Peter, but also because of what we did with the money yeah. the first year. Mm -hmm. We got the third round of funding, again, a confluence of Tony Jennings, Dan Webster, leadership, 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 but you gotta do something with the money. And so the third round of funding came because we had branched out by that time and we'd done projects like we did with Peter. Yeah. We'd done projects, starting to do projects with companies of all sizes. So what we said to Mark, um, Mark called about three months ago before he lost Davina. And he said, we've been meeting a lot. I said, yes, sir. We've been meeting a lot. I said, yeah, I got it the first time. He says, all we've been doing is meeting. I said, Mark, you got it. I said, just do something, do it, okay? And, and he goes, okay, what, what do you suggest? I said, Mark, you got a, you got a research foundation? Yeah. You got 250000 yeah. Does MJ have a research foundation at FAU? Yeah. You got 250000 Yeah. Do you have friendship with the University of Miami? Yeah, kind of sort of. I said, do they have a research foundation? Yeah. I said, then why don't you each put up 250000 and just start doing projects like we've been doing projects. And once you've demonstrated success, I think you'll have a better chance of getting yeah. some matching funds mm -hmm. from the state to start well, doing what we're doing. Besides, you're going to get your money back off, you call them recoveries or loadings or what's the proper term? for what is charged to the companies that the overhead. 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 Yeah. The, the, the other thing you just said that, that I think is, is really important is you, you encouraged him to talk to MJ, at, at least and MJ is not Swallow, it's MJ Sanders who's the president down there at FAU. But the people in the legislature and other folks in the community like to see universities work together. So, you know, the fact that it isn't just one university working in the community helps in generating uh, financial and other support. So, I, you know, I think that's really good advice. But they've got to have um, at least a few employers down there, uh, you know, between that whole corridor from, uh, from Fort Lauderdale essentially down to, to <coughs> they've got to have at least a few employers they can enlist to come in as part of that. I think, John, at this point they, have, they, they haven't quite figured out that part of the equation. All of the schools are together, uh -huh. all of the economic developers are together, and the private sector hasn't been brought to the table yeah. yet. 
Well, yeah, and that, they won't get anywhere ultimately <laughs> until they do that. But, right? but what the, Randy's advice was, we'll get yeah, two or three right. of those private developers on board. For that <coughs> well, they, 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 need, they, they need to reach out and ask. If them. they look at their foundation, let alone if they've got it, even without a research foundation, just the university foundation, mm -hmm. they've almost certainly got a few employers who are in manufacturing or uh, mm -hmm. some kind of uh, mm -hmm. research operation that they can bring in and just say, look, give us your your research folks uh, to, to attend a few uh, seances here and let's try to get this going. I, 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 we represent, for instance, Florida Power and Light. I haven't asked them to come to the table. I'm sure they will. We, re we Through our partnership with MSL, we, we represent United Technologies and Pratt Whitney. I was down there a couple of weeks ago and I asked one of the plant executives about how much research is done. I said, well, you know, we do a lot of primary research in this specific area, which I'm not allowed to tell you about because it shoot me. But something very important is we got applied research going on all the time. Yeah. So when we have this conversation, I'm going to put those people together. Please. That's and the kind of partnership that, I mean, jet propulsion? Yeah. You'd think they'd kill for that. <laughs> Hello? But, but, you know, Peter, I, you shared with me years back that a lot of the most... Um, Profit enhancing, if you will, work that you did in cooperation with the, the quarter, I think, was was really uh, operational research. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the industrial, classic industrial engineering. How to make it better. Yeah, and, and that, you know, you could be oper you could be working with a trucking firm. Yeah, and and have have, have opportunities yeah. there. Right. That, we did one at USF. Well, but you yeah. know, it, it, you don't have to be in necessarily a high tech industry. To have really good engineering and scientific uh, uh, impact. You know, getting yeah. soups and they're, they're, they're yeah. there. It's really very valuable. You have any kind of an operation where there's stuff moving through a production line, and and I use the term production line loosely because it could be uh, could be chemicals, it could be mess, it could mm -hmm. be a bunch of things. But things are moving, and they're limited by processes. Yeah, understanding that process is really important, and that's something the university spent a lot of time on. And was very valuable for us. We got a lot out of that. But it's one of the basic skill sets that, that IEs bring to the table. One of the things I think that will help them is to broaden their horizon. One of the things that has been very powerful for us is the fact that we focus on a number of sectors. We haven't limited it other than to attach it to the areas that the partner universities believed were their real strengths, where they where, where there was the potential for a cluster to develop, where we had, we were teaching and researching in areas that match the interests of some industry that's already here, modeling simulation, aerospace. When Bernie and University of Florida joined, they said, "Hey, don't forget agri agritech." We had, I don't think any of us had ever heard the term before, you know. But there's a lot of technology that mirrors life sciences in in agribusiness. Right now, the folks in South Florida are focused solely on life sciences. They have, they believe, for whatever reason, that because of scripts, because of the success in bringing them down here, that that's the ticket to ride. A few years back, they were the internet coast. And mm -hmm. they're looking, they're trying to figure out, they need to look to their, to their strengths. That didn't, that didn't go anywhere. Yeah. So they need to look. Reach. Yeah. yeah, they need to look to their broad academic strengths and say, who can we match this to and support? One, one excuse me, one, just a quick answer to your question, too, uh, by using another example, is uh, uh, research parks. You know, a lot of people uh, ask uh, High Tech Carter and the research par park to come help us be as successful. And uh, a research park, is you could build a research park and set up an office and uh, uh, by that I mean just the land and the infrastructure and set up an office. And that's what the folks at Innovation Way have already contracted with us to do. Joe doesn't go, ever go out there, okay, because somebody like Peter's got to come in and express an interest in being there. So why... Um, you know, how do you start these kind of things? A uh, research park is a good example. You've got to have some tenants. Our research park owes its success not to the high tech Carter, but to the simulation and modeling industry and the presence the of the military. military. 
Yeah. That's why it's doing what it is. You, Doctor, do you think that uh, the involvement with the business community going back 16 years <coughs> helped get other things approved, such as the medical school, the stadium, that is, you coming into contact with all of these uh, business leaders, the business community yeah, getting to know you, and the university coming to, uh, to trust you guys? Yeah, I think that's that's the way it works. Is it wasn't to say if you think about either of the projects you mentioned, it wasn't the nuts and bolts of them. Um, it was the fact that they had associated us with successful a successful enterprise that, that we had been able to or help organize something and get it really working. And they they had seen the university as a competent organization. So is it possible that those things might not have happened if it had not been for the initiative of the high tech corridor? Well, I suppose so. You know, I, I probably less so with the uh, less so with the uh, stadium. But um, uh, when you ask people to get behind something as complicated as getting the medical school approved, probably the uh, perceived success of the, <coughs> of the uh, high tech corridor was a was a real aid. Right. I, I can give you one very solid example. Ken Pro, President of the Senate. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to get fired. Right. Okay. And I go in and talk to Ken uh, uh, and explain this, this was uh, I think the two-year term before he was president. Right. He was chairman of appropriations I believe. And I go in and sit down and talk to him and I said you've heard about the FIA project and what we're trying to do there and uh, the, the, Maybe a few words changed, but this is exactly the way the conversation went. Do I need to give you a white paper or do I need to put any other facts or anything together for you? And it's the absolutely truth. He looked at me and he said, if John Hitt says this is what you're going to do with the money and this is what it'll do, then I'm okay. That's exactly what he said. And the file money was eventually in the budget. There's. I, I'd forgotten, Dan told me that story at one point, but I'd forgotten. Um, there, there's an important thing nested within that that Dan and others at the table deserve credit on too. Um, universities sometimes get a bad reputation for taking money to do one thing and then doing something else with it. And that's something that Dan and I have worked very hard to get all of our people to understand is you don't do that. If you ever want to get money again from those people, you don't do that. You, you ask for the money to do X, you do X. If for some reason that just can't happen, you go back to them and if need be, get it re, uh, get it reappropriated. But don't just take it under the uh, supposition, promise that you're going to do one thing and then do something different with it. That's deadly. Surprising how often it happens. <laughs> well, I have a couple couple last questions. One of them is, uh, what do you see as the challenges now that you're 15 years into this? Um, the answer I was honored to give uh, a couple weeks ago in a similar setting was. If you believe in the partnership, it really is a partnership, and you put yourself on the line. Uh, so I, I called Dan last week, following the conversation I had with David Norton. And I said, David, uh, we've been trying through some very, very tough times to get even one-time funding, let alone recurring funding for, for UF. But it's still a major objective. Uh, the governor accepted five million per state university that wanted to adopt our program on the basis the money would come to us. We would validate their program and only once we validated their program would the money be transferred to said university. In doing so, that would have increased our funding as well, which we would be very happy. When you think in terms of UCF, running through the budget by January, February, which it has historically done, that would tell you that there are plenty of projects running through the, the, the research project. <laughs> the research <laughs> is consumed by January, February, because we have that many great projects
coming to the university to partner with Corridor Money to do the applied research. Well, your, your gut was if, if you had uh, an amount more than we have now, we've taken budget cuts just as the university has, of course. Well, we could do more if we had more in terms of funding, but we didn't put it that way. The, what we put it was to establish a program for any state university that wanted to do what we're doing. We said in the process, uh, our three, UCF, USF, and UF, we would like to see recurring funding initially at the two million level uh, for UF. Uh, so that's a major goal. So uh, hopefully it doesn't take the next 15 years to get that done. Uh, that would be a major goal. Well, I think one of the things we've got to, to address, and I think we have been doing so, but um, look around the table, we're not spring chickens. And uh, uh, even even a young guy like Roger, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this Friday, I guess it is, I'll be 72 years old. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be present, but it's not another 20 years. Was. And uh, Randy's going to want to be fully retired uh, one day, as will Dan. Peter already is a rascal. Um, so you know we've got to. We I think we've institutionalized things pretty well. But if you got a president who just didn't just did not understand or commit to partnership, uh, it would be hard, I think, for this to survive. Now, when when you think about the five goals in partnership and how much we are invested as an institution in that concept and in the practice. I don't think it's likely that the next president will just not care about partnership. I think that's going to be a criterion in the selection process that uh, uh, we've set up. Um, but uh, that, that's clearly an issue. You know, you, does it survive the, the person, you know, the, the people who have put it in place and operated it and sustained it now for 16 years? Bernie is in the process of, of going on to his next mm -hmm. vocation or application or what have you. Dentist, I believe, or researcher, mm -hmm. or a dentist. I'll bet you he doesn't go back to pulling teeth. No. Oh, no. He'll, he's <laughs> going to be here in Orlando for a lot of his So, is it really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the transition plan right. for a couple, three with years the, With the research center? Yeah, and developing um, Part health partnerships, you know, the expanding. I think Great. on what they've got with uh, Orlando Health and wonderful. We have um, shared it this morning with folks from all over the country that are part of this ITSI program. Some nationally acclaimed teachers. Uh, we have been recognized through the Tech Camp Tech Path program as the best of the best in the state of Florida in terms of of STEM programs. Um, I want the gentleman sitting to your right to close his ears right now. We've had his leadership in trying to um, bridge a number of STEM programs at our universities and in our region. Uh, PRISM, I don't like the term, no matter how you succinctly try to pronounce it, the first thing that comes to mind is not uh, a uh, optical device uh, or an acronym for STEM programs. Anyway, uh, he lets me say that each time we get together. But the idea of merging all of these STEM programs across our region to make them more effective uh, would be a, a, a target for sooner than later in the next 15 years. It needs to happen with limited resources. Roger's team has put together every school superintendent, thanks to Jim Schott and others, across our, is there 10? Ten of them? Ten, ten. ten counties. So that's the linchpin that you've got, that you've got school superintendents mm -hmm. who've come and gone. Bill Vogel, his replacement. Um, Orange County, he'll shoot me. Just retired. Wrong blocker. Don't, don't mm -hmm. tell Ron I did that. All this transition and they're still together. Yeah, but, but his they're only successor is also a UCF oh, you you Oh, that'll help. So so here's, here's, yeah, that's right. The school superintendent in Orange, Seminole, and Lake County. All three of them, 80, 81, 82 grads. Hmm. That'll help us it. keep that group together, but there's so much more in terms of yeah. potential. Yeah. So how do we do a better job of orchestrating that and sharing best practices? We, we take so much for granted the ability to communicate and partner vertically in, in this, 
in, in Central Florida. It's not even the case in a lot of the rest of the state. Where, you, you know, you could say, well, we're going to work with the schools. We're going to work with the, the state colleges. Hell, there are parts of this state where they're at war with one another. Not, you know, not only do they not cooperate and collaborate, they're fighting one another. And we, we tend to take that for granted. Yeah. It's, instead of working together in, a, in difficult times, without mentioning the topic, because I think it's still um, like this right here, a signed document, but the, the school system and the community colleges have come to us for a joint endeavor. And uh, that's an example, and we all talked, uh, uh, the three government relations people, as we sat around the table and talked and said, do you know anywhere else, not only in the state, but maybe in the country, where this kind of initiative would come from the K-12? And uh, so uh, I, I think that's something unique. I think one of the long-range goals is uh, that uh, we need to move even with more design and strategy to emerge as truly the, the statewide model and help everywhere we can go in every corner of Florida to instill this program. And uh, I, I think that should be one of our goals. And Roger knows this. I think, uh, but and he and Kerry and his organization do a great job. But I still think, just like I said a while ago, we need to uh, uh, double our efforts to make the policymakers uh, aware of all these other programs that are going on behind the scenes that are so vital to the foundation of creating that high technology and the workforce to go along with it. And that's <coughs> one that to me. And I talk about this all the time. That is why having this history is such an important tool for us in our toolbox to tell that story. So once we chronicled where this thing's been, it's a lot easier to, to, to do that. Yeah. And, and hit, hit somebody over the head with a book. Yeah. And, and, and one last goal I think that would really help us, and I've been saying this for years, and, and it takes the the MJs and the faculty, but we need one huge hit, <laughs> one great big project that the three institutions secure together. We need a high-tech Semitech or a high-tech something with hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal level. And if we could ever get all of those faculty members working together unselfishly at that level to come up with some kind of sharing program like that, I think that would just be an indelible footprint on the map of what we're about. And then, you know, that, that brings up a point that we really haven't talked about with you, but it ain't for not trying that we haven't gotten there. Behind the scenes, we've made some incredible efforts mm -hmm. to try and uh, focus federal energy and other uh, grant-making activities on this region, we've come very close. And, but the great news is that out of that, we have, I always look at it as part of that pajama hotline we have on Tuesday morning, we have a bunch of people on the phone on Tuesday morning who can respond like that and put together responses to opportunities. One of these days, we're going to hit yeah, one of the world's on was one. We've had two, by the way. Guess, guess, guess what, from what company the two projects came from. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Uh, one of your graduates. Um, and it was a wafer publishing deal where we brought professors and students in from US, USF and UCF to work on. You know, there's a good example, too, of what Roger said, the learning that takes place as you respond to these. Uh, we were a lot better in our attempts to bring uh, Sanford Burnham here than we were in our attempts to bring uh, Scripps here. I mean, we learned a lot from the near miss on on uh, on Scripps, and we were we were a lot closer on that than people knew. Um, what's what's the guy's name that's head of Scripps going to return now? Richard. Yeah, yeah and anyway, he he was when we were out at the airport before they left to go back down south, 
he was asking if I could come out and meet with his board the next week. We, we were that close to getting that, but we, I, I correctly forecast that we would not. That the farther they got away from us, the more his desire to be down there with the billionaires uh, would take over, and it's, that's what happened. That area also looked like La Jolla, so yeah. a lot yeah. of those people were coming because they wanted that Yes. Yeah. environmental. So, you know, we, we had a better offer um, in terms of what we really could provide for them, but there was a lifestyle component that was very important to them, and I just I thought the closer they got to that, the farther they got from Lake Nona and what we were offering them, um, you know, the less we were going to be happy with the result. And that's indeed what happened. But boy, what we learned not just here at the university, but what uh, Orlando and, and Orange County learned made a big difference mm -hmm. in the next effort. I mean, I, the one thing that surprised me ever since we got involved in this was um, that at so many places the u local university is either uh, the 500 pound gorilla, and I'm thinking Yale uh, and New Haven, or else uh, is an ivory tower that uh, almost is ashamed of Duke and Durham being in the community. Mm -hmm. And this is really very unique. This is, mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I can't think of other other cities where this has happened, where the local university has played there are such a role in the business community. Yeah, yeah. no, that, and that makes a big difference for us in, in the support we can get for various things. That's how we had University of Florida, Vermont, Gregonica, Dean of Engineering. A friend, I guess they've been together in a past life with President Matchin. Vermont called and said we'd like to join the quarter. Um, and I said, we're honored. I'd ask him why. He said, well, there's no way we can stay in the top 20 or have any hope of getting into the top, top 10 in engineering colleges in the U.S. if we don't climb out of our ivory tower and get down and start partnering with companies uh, to do applied research. Not basic, applied research. Oh, by the way, his, his stats, he knew it. The 70% of those companies in Florida are in your quarter, and we'd like to partner with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we can just come down, but that's not the way to do it. We'd like to figure out how to partner with you. Um, I, I think that's a, a change in attitude among a lot of the institutions. Yeah. Again, which is to your credit, is this concept of partnership that it does work. Because I think what Randy said is uh, Bernie could be here, do whatever he wants to do. Uh, he does need us, but in reality, he can do it without yeah, us. It's a strategic view. They see, as, they, as he puts it, we're the survivor. And, and they would like to work with us. I hope that survives Bernie. Yes, that's, a, uh, that's, that's always a question. A question. You know, if, you, if you've got a really an old style, rigid competitor mentality, uh, that might not. But John, I think to a large, large extent, that's going to, we'll know that very quickly. Mm -hmm. but that search committee was given the sense of the importance of that partnership. Well, and isn't, isn't uh, their chair, isn't that David Brown again? Yeah. Yeah. And he and Bernie are really doing that selection. What can we do for you? Well, uh, this is... Can I have one other question you said? Uh, well, uh, they answered it, it in, in, okay. in going through that, but uh, this has been very helpful. Um, a lot of the things that you said, I had kind of um, gathered through looking at other things and I kind of had the intuition that this was the way it was but it's very helpful to hear you say it and confirm it that that's um, that's the way it was and there were some new things I learned and I, I know your time is very valuable and I really appreciate the time you're welcome thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you and I have to say you know on a much smaller level um, you know I've been to work at a couple of universities before I got here this is, the, this is the first university I've been to that actually meant it when it said partnerships. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, even in the history department, Riches now has 28 partnerships between different oh, departments, wow. Wow. The, the community, and businesses. You guys and gals over there are, are doing partnerships. It's, it, yeah. it's known. It was, it's really been amazing to me how well that works. Did you know we have our own museum now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Up in You're the dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a number of people have said, <laughs> 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 You're a leg up on <laughs> three points. <laughs> a number of people uh, that I've talked to and in, in, involved in this 
that said that giving me a pay raise would enhance the university. Yeah, exactly. would. Have you given that much? Uh, much? We have. We've thought about it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Actually, no I understand what is we're going to. <laughs> I understand what we're going to do is some research on that. <laughs> Guys, I got a history staff. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.